Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, we've had a very nice introduction about extrinsic factors, and I'm going to talk more about them. Uh, so when we think about the coffee drinking experience, we must consider elements that are beyond the product, in our case, the coffee itself. Um, the consumption experience involves extrinsic factors. And in the case of coffee, we can think about extrinsic factors that are directly associated to consumption, such as the coffee cup and the coffee packaging. Regarding the coffee cup, um, our research group has investigated how different characteristics of the cup um, has impacted or can impact both the sensory and hedonic evaluation of the coffee by consumers and experts. And it turns out that the cup shape, that the cup color, the cup texture, and the cup metallic coat, so all these attributes of the cup can modify the perception and the hedonic evaluation of coffee, okay? Okay, so extrinsic factors as opposed to intrinsic factors, which are physically part of the product itself, are those factors that uh, do not physically belong to the coffee in our case, but is somehow associated to it. There is a relationship to it in the mind of the consumer, okay? Okay, so when we think about cross-model correspondences, then it's very nice to imagine how those things go together. Um, so, uh, cross-modally speaking, those extrinsic factors can be congruently or incongruently paired with the product itself, with the coffee in our case, okay? Uh, we can define cross-model correspondences as our automatic tendency, I can even say our brain's automatic tendency to associate features or attributes in different sensory modalities, like the matching between color in vision and basic tastes in gustation. It's the associ association we make between the dark green color and bitter taste. When we see a dark green food, we expect a bitter taste. This is because we have associated that. So the likelihood or the probability of this dark green food to be bitter is very high, given my prior experience about that, okay? So this is a cross-model correspondence between dark green color and bitter taste. Um, right. When we think about those examples here, so the red color works better to communicate the strawberry juice than it works to communicate the banana juice, simply because this configuration matches the cross-model association that the consumer has already internalized, okay? So the red color will trigger the expectation towards a flavor that tastes red, or a red taste, if it makes sense. Um, and when this happens, when we have a congruency, a matching between an intrinsic factor and extrinsic factor, well, the multimodal experience just works. It just, it's easier to process, it just flows, and it's likely that the consumer will appreciate it more, will like it more. So in this case, we have congruency. Um, pairing the red color with the banana juice, well, I say that perhaps the consumer will may take a moment to process what's going on, to understand what's going on, to process the incongruency. Uh, or the disconfirmation of expectation. 
in recent years, the function of packaging has gone far beyond its original role in product portioning, preservation, and protection. Uh, nowadays, you have multi-sensory packaging, okay? And multi-sensory packaging takes into account the human senses. It takes into account specifically the multi-sensory perception or the integration of the information coming from different senses. Um, and this is very important. Packaging is a powerful element for brands when it comes to creating value, when it comes to communicate the attributes of a product, when it comes to setting the right product expectation in the consumer's mind. Um, so this example here is the Fanta bottle that was redesigned in 2018, inspired by the squeezing of an orange. Uh, in addition to communicating this um, sensation of squeezing a fresh fruit, um, when really enhances the brand experience, it, um, this unique shape also enhanced um, shelf standout. Okay, so from Fanta back to specialty coffee. Uh, Multisensory packaging can and should be used for specialty coffee. And I've been talking about that for, I, I don't know, five years now. Um, indeed, um, the description of an overall flavor profile should not be tied to semantic description or a overloading amount of technical information for the consumer, which is still the modus operandi of the specialty coffee industry when it, co when it comes to communicate flavor profiles for the consumers. Um, if we look at these coffee bags, you know, lots of sensory descriptors written on it and lots of technical information. Well, this is much more B2B than B2C communication strategy, you see. Um, the consumer may feel a little bit lost. Um, is it really meaningful? Is it informative somehow about the flavor profile? Which is what matters in the end. Um, is it appealing at all? Well, there are other ways to communicate flavor profile, and one way out is multisensory packaging. Um, our research group in Brazil have conducted um, studies on how the design of the packaging label um, could affect consumers sensory evaluation, hedonic evaluation, and also purchase behavior. Um, in this study here, we used a two by two factorial design, uh, so we could change the colors and also these, uh, the shape of these contour lines that we can see on the labels. We selected uh, these two colors, green and pink, because these colors have been shown to be associated to the basic taste sweet and sour, or acidic, respectively. And we selected a angular contour line and a round contour line, so the angular being the kiki shape and the round being the booba shape, and they have been associated to sourness for kiki and sweetness for booba shapes, okay? So what we saw here, when the coffee was paired to congruent labels, what does it mean? When the two elements of the label were communicating the same thing, pink and round, and on the other hand, angular and green, the coffee was liked more and the purchase intent was higher. When the same coffee was tasted alongside an incongruent label. Uh, this other study um, showed the impact of the typeface. Um, this study was based on previous evidence that the typeface, the shape of the typeface, better saying, is associated 
to basic tastes. So we selected again an angular typeface and a round typeface to present the label for the consumers. And we served the same coffee alongside these two bags. Um, and what we saw here was that the angular typeface affected the expectations towards acidity. Um, so the consumers were expecting acidity only by looking at the label. And this expectation went over to influence uh, the perception, the actual perception of acidity during tasting. And this impacted how the coffee was liked, so it was liked more and the purchase intent was higher when the same coffee was served alongside the round shape, the round typeface. Last year, we started, our research group started a new research uh, project in collaboration uh, with the Coffee Science Foundation and Saver Brands. Uh, and this project, this new project aims at understanding the effect of packaging on the perception of specialty coffee. Well, um, when you think about packaging, multisensorily speaking, uh, it, is, it, it is a collection of uh, visual, auditory, tactile elements, right? Um, as a starting point, we decided to focus on the role of the color of the packaging in influencing sensory, hedonic, and purchase behavior of coffees. Actually, we want to understand how to use color to communicate the overall flavor profile of the coffee, or to prime the consumer's expectations towards the main aroma and flavor notes of the coffee inside. And there are several uh, multisensory studies on packaging, and they show that the color of the bag, of the package, uh, really, really um, affects how people perceive what is inside. So it is a very important tool to set expectations um, of what is inside. Right, uh, so we have completed the first stage of this study. Um, and the, in this first stage, we aimed at building a database of uh, specialty coffee consumers based in the US. So we put some uh, inclusion criteria in place just to be sure that we are getting the right consumers for this study. Um, and we tested, uh, we um, invited, so a total of 343 consumers took part in this online survey that uh, we ran last year. And uh, with this survey, we wanted to learn more about the demographics and also about the consumption behavior and choice. So here we can see the gender and the age distribution of our sample and also the U.S. states with the larger number of participants. Regarding consumption data, well, we can see that the filter coffee or the drip coffee is the coffee that's consumed by a larger number of participants daily, okay? Uh, so we have the number of participants on top of each bar, and um, we have the description of the coffee beverage below. So filter coffee, it's more consumed daily than espresso and milk-based um, coffee, specialty coffee, and also more than non-specialty coffee. Okay, we ask them about the non-specialty coffee consumption too. Uh, and one consumer can be in more than one group there. It was a check all that apply test. Um, and if we look at the other plot, uh, when we ask them about the most often location of consumption of specialty coffee, and that was a single choice. 85% of the participants selected at home, followed by coffee shops, 
and then followed by restaurants and at work. And it's important to say that for this survey, we ask them to consider their usual coffee consumption and disregard the pandemic years. So this was explicitly said. Um, so it's difficult to know if they um, did that or not, but it's impressive this at home uh, being the most often location of consumption of specialty coffee. Right, uh, we also ask these participants to rank these attributes in order of importance when buying specialty coffee. And well, there's roasting level again. Um, so roasting level uh, was the most important criterion when selecting, when buying specialty coffee. Okay, followed by beans origin. Roasting level is a very important indicator of the overall flavor profile. So it's meaningful, it's informative for the consumer decision-making process when buying coffee. Um, and we also asked them to rank in order of importance those criteria regarding packaging. And we can see that the most important criterion is this overall, this general concept of design, right? I have to say that there are several ways when we think about multisensory packaging, there are several ways of communicating roasting level um, with multisensory elements. Um, there are ways to use design, to use graphic elements, to use colors, to use position of logo, um, to communicate a strong dark roast instead of a light roast. Okay, so next steps now of this research. Uh, this year, we are planning to carry out both online and central location tests. The central locations will be coffee shops. Um, first, we want to understand further the role of the color scheme of the packaging in communicating the overall flavor profile, the main aroma and flavor notes of the coffee inside, and how this would impact sensory, edonic, and also purchase behavior of specialty coffee consumers. Um, we also want to understand design. It was the most important criterion for packaging selection. Well, design is a multimodal, it is a uh, multidimensional, it's a complex construct, so we are planning to use multivariate methods to assess the impact of different components of this design construct on choice. And this is it, thank you so much. I'd like to thank all the supporters and the researchers involved in this project.